Hi, and welcome back to Postscript. I'm John Peterson from the Arlington Institute, and we come to you uh, monthly, more or less, throughout the year with interesting conversations with visiting guests here in Berkeley Springs, West Virginia, who come to be part of our Berkeley Springs Transition Talks. This is a series that we've hosted for many years to try to bring uh, extraordinary kind of thinkers and writers and authors to who think about where the world is going and some aspects of the future and this extraordinary kind of transition that we're in the middle of that's going to produce a new human, a new world, as far as we're concerned. And we're happy to continue our conversation this morning with Rosemary Ellen Guiley. And Rosemary, if you'll go back and listen to her interview, her introduction in the last segment, uh, has written now over 70 or 80, how many books? Almost 70. I, Almost I think I'm at 68 or 69. 69. It's hard to keep track, I'm sure. <laughs> yes. Uh, but anyway, a wonderfully prolific author who works and thinks about all things kind of paranormal and unusual. And it's this kind of uh, leading edge, this transitional edge into a larger kind of world uh, that uh, she aggregates in a very interesting way and kind of considers all of the different aspects of, to it. And in particular, you've been involved in a research project that has got, got some pretty substantial kind of information. Tell us about that. I'm on the Board of Directors and Research Committee for the Foundation for Research into Extraterrestrial and Extraordinary Experiences. That's a mouthful. It is, uh, and uh, you know, it, it encompasses the broad spectrum of contact, not just ETs, but all kinds of contact, and they're all interwoven. This was um, started around 2013, and um, the executive director, Ray Hernandez, uh, is, the, is the, uh, the driving force behind it. And uh, Dr. Edgar Mitchell, while he was alive, was uh, one of the founders. Dr. Rudy Schild uh, from Harvard is uh, also one of the founders, and Mary Rodwell from Australia. Those were the four that really got it going. And uh, I joined in 2014. Uh, we have uh, assembled uh, a really spectacular uh, array of experts, lay people such as myself, as well as scientists of varying kinds, uh, to examine the picture of contact and uh, Free conducted the largest ever global survey of experiencers, uh, which involved over 3,000 people from about 100 countries around the world. What do you mean is an experiencer? What does that term mean for you? Uh, someone who has had contact with non-human in uh, non intelligent being, an NHIB, non-human intelligent being, okay. which has uh, a lot of room for description and definition. And of course, many people consider that to be ETs, but it goes much broader than that because uh, we have people describing uh, beings that seem to be energy beings, they're spiritual beings, but they don't know where they're from or exactly what they are. Uh, they get mixed in with uh, experiences of the afterlife, religious figures, contact with the dead, paranormal experiences. Uh, it's very difficult to separate things out uh, when, pe when you look at the broad spectrum. But um, we conducted this survey. Uh, it was online and it was uh, self-selecting. We advertised in MUFON, Facebook, uh, various organizations. MUFON, or, what's is that? the Mutual what? UFO Network. Okay. Uh, organizations that were oriented toward extraordinary experience to encourage people to participate. And uh, we are still analyzing the results. We have published some so, of the results. So what, is, so what, are, what are you finding out? Well, approximately 70% of the respondents report favorable transformative changes as a result of their contact experiences. They might be physical, they might be spiritual, it might be a combination of both. So yes, people are still having negative experiences. Some. some. Uh, there were people who reported, for example, what we would call the classic ET abduction experience of being taken during sleep, um, operated on or probed, probed uh, and, and then returned. Um, but uh, by and large, most people have reported um, benign to positive experiences. So um, this survey 
uh, we've uh, done three parts so far. And the first two parts, we asked uh, respondents a total of 554 multiple choice questions. Right. And in phase three, <clears throat> if you participated in phase one and two, you were invited to uh, participate in phase three, which was open-ended questions. You could write answers as long as you wanted. There were 70 of those questions. So we've gotten quite a good picture now from people about their contact experiences. We've asked about missing time, expanded time, uh, whether or not you saw a craft, whether or not you were on board a craft. Uh, uh, did you have healing uh, done? Did you have a mystical experience, a negative experience? What's your family background? Uh, are there members of your family experiencers? What's your blood type? We looked at so many factors that have been considered in contact experience. And for me, uh, because I'm always interested in subjective experience, th th because this is what drives consciousness, yeah. are subjective personal experiences which have common ground and patterns among all human beings. That's what changes our consciousness. Yeah. So that's the first thing I look at. And uh, I was um, very absorbed in, and I still am, uh, what people were reporting about their psycho, spiritual, and physical changes that they said resulted from their contact. And um, uh, they do have this correlation to Kundalini, um, it, which in Eastern mysticism is the traditional way to raise your spiritual vibration or consciousness through activating an energy that you're born with that resides in the body and when it becomes activated, it spiritualizes your chakras, your energy field, your consciousness, and it brings about these changes. But now we have, when I'm, I, I'm asking the question, is contact the new yoga? Because we have people experiencing these changes as a result of contact. What do they think it's about? Do they, are they saying anything about what other than just the personal reaction to it? Are they getting any images or pictures or messages about a larger kind of effort that's going on here or what this is all about? It seems that by and large, experiencers have to come to their own conclusions about what's going on uh, because um, we have found that, that uh, for the most part, uh, the beings do not say why they're making contact. Uh, they're not here to save us, heal us, uh, give us technology, um, alter our religion. Uh, so why are they here uh, if they're not telling us? And so people are left with making their own interpretations. Now, um, many experiencers have said that they feel that the purpose of the contact was transformation, that um, they needed to, to go through this elevation and awareness and consciousness uh, for some greater purpose that they may not even understand. So uh, some, some of these factors are, aside from uh, physical changes, um, people feeling more energy running through the body, they have healing abilities open up like through their hands. Um, these are very uh, uh, characteristic of kundalini awakenings as well. They go through psychic changes. They become more psychic, telepathic. Uh, their incidences of precognition go up. Um, and the spiritual component of that is they have a greater understanding of who they are. They have uh, moments of mystical awareness where they feel they comprehend everything in the universe. Mm -hmm. And it shifts their perspective to a cosmic level where they see themselves as part of a unified whole. Wow. And the dominant energy in this unified whole is a love and oneness. Mm. Uh, and so it's contact for many people is a mystical experience. Mm. It's, it's not just a meeting with a gray guy with yeah. big black eyes. It's something else on a whole different level. And uh, that is a significant shift for humanity. Right. Do, do you get any patterns of uh, uh, indication to say where these entities are coming from or, you know, why they present themselves? I mean, is there any, does it just happen or do people come away saying we know where they came from or what they wanted to do? Well, we, we ask the question, uh, do, do the beings say who they are and mm -hmm. where they're from? And the majority of our respondents said they, they 
don't know. Uh, they did not get that information. But of those who did, um, the most common response was from the Pleiades. Uh -huh. And uh, then we have some of, uh, you know, b descending from that, uh, I would say the usual respondents that we read about from channelers, mm -hmm. the Arcturians, um, the uh, Orionids or the Orion people, um, people right. from, you know, Zeta Reticuli. Uh, it, 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 once, once you get past the Pleiadians, who seem to be the, the dominant ones who identify themselves, uh, the, the curve goes way, way down. But they're all from the stars. I mean, now, right. earlier in the first segment, you said that uh, your understanding was, or your pres presumption was, that a lot of this was from Earth, terrestrially kind of generated, though, from different dimensions and so on. I mean, how does, how does that work? Well, keep in mind that most of our respondents said they don't know where these beings right. are from. Okay. So potentially they could be from these parallel dimensions that, uh, that are around Earth. And uh, I, I do believe that we have visitors from uh, otherworldly right. places, uh, other star systems and, and perhaps other planets. But uh, it seems like the bulk of our contact, uh, at least what we know about it, uh, has no identifiable origin, which means they could be beings right from right here on Earth, even though they may seem to the percipient to be coming from off sure. planet. Sure. Do any of them look like us? Yes, yes, and in fact, um, uh, it, when, when we ask people to describe uh, beings, the, uh, the greatest category was humanoid, uh, followed by uh, you know, spirit-like beings, uh, beings that had more energy form, and the top, the top three were the humanoids, the energy beings, and the greys. And then after that, we have the reptilians, uh, the insectoid beings, hybrids, and uh, even large animal-like beings that you would put Sasquatch into that category. You know, the, the, big, the big question is, what is this about? And, and what are they trying to do? I mean, do, they, do, do people come away saying this is just an arbitrary kind of event that happened, or is it part of a larger kind of, of uh, momentum or impact or, or effect that's going on? I mean, how would you characterize where this is all going and what this is all about? Well, for the individual experiencer, um, in most cases, uh, the beings do not say why they selected certain individuals or families. Uh, so here again, the, the experiencer is left to uh, try and sort that out on, on their own. From, from my perspective as a researcher, I do believe that there is a bigger picture going on. And uh, uh, I, I believe that human beings were seeded by other races, that our true origins uh, are from off-world off or alternate realities. And it wasn't any one race, it was probably a collection of uh, other intelligent beings that uh, seeded humanity for, we can speculate on the reasons. Uh, and uh, so I, I believe that they look in on us, they monitor us. Um, Maybe some of them don't try to influence us all that much, but maybe some of them see uh, where our evolution is going and how important it is for consciousness to expand to, uh, into what would be called ascension. You know, the ascension of the human spirit, the spiritualizing of the body, uh, all of the things that the mystics have talked about throughout the ages, which they predicted would not happen for a very long time. We're in fast forward mode now, thanks mm -hmm. to technology, I believe. And so what if there is a purpose to give us a little yep. help along yeah. the way? That um, they don't force it on us, but they present the opportunity for expansion via contact, knowing that that seed is going to take hold and flower in a certain percentage of the population. Yeah, it's, it's, it's fascinating because uh, there is uh, so much happening in so many kind of places uh, all at the same time. And uh, until you back away and get this larger kind of perspective that perhaps and certainly sounds like it, some of it comes out of this kind of research, research that you're doing, uh, you can't see the patterns and the shapes, but you certainly you're watching the the end of the old system and the collapse and the, uh, and the ineffectiveness of the geopolitics and, 
and the economic system and education and energy and any number of other kind of things. And so the, the, what are the contributing factors to this new and the driving forces of this new emergent world are, are really quite, quite, quite fascinating. And, and the, the notion that it's a larger system that is not just limited to what we see here and, uh, and what we understand on, on, our, on, our, on our human kind, our general human experience, it just opens up the, the, the idea and it goes into some of these spiritual things as you've alluded to that says we're all interconnected and we're all part of a larger kind of system and we're all uh, you know, just uh, granular parts of kind of a oneness or the uh, a mind of God or the great spirit or whatever you want, would want to call it. And therefore, there is this constant interaction and interconnection, whether it's physical or otherwise, that's always kind of going on. And this is just part of this kind of evolutionary flow. Yeah, I, I do believe that it is, but I, I believe that we have a lot at stake right now. And uh, that may be one reason why uh, these experiences are more and more coming to light. Because um, if it is the human destiny, which I believe it is, to evolve toward God consciousness and, and toward uh, you know, union uh, right. with the absolute, then uh, that the process of ascension, so to speak, then you know, we, we really overcome the physical body. Uh, we, we don't need it anymore or it changes uh, energetically as consciousness changes. Uh, we're in a very dense form now. And as consciousness refines, to higher frequencies, um, we, we could become like the energy beings that, that we're in contact with. But th what you're but, saying is there's a spectrum of kind of density that is kind of defined by frequency, if you will, and that at lower frequencies is kind of this physical reality. And as you work your way up into these kind of ephemeral or spiritual or luminous or other kind of things, those by kind of physical or is this, uh, or uh, scientific dimension uh, descriptions would be a higher frequency that goes higher and higher. Well, the, the downside that I see is that um, whatever powers that be that would not like to see right. uh, human consciousness uh, ascend uh, have the, the agenda of keeping us in this dense, right. dense level. Which is about fear. And it's about stuff. fear, it's about addiction, uh, addiction to technology. Uh, there's talk about implants, having all kinds of implants in us. Are we going to become like the Borg hmm. uh, and, and just be automatons serving some sort of overlords? Right. Uh, that, I think, is, is one of the agendas playing out, that humanity is, uh, is seen as, uh, as some sort of um, food source, yeah. slave labor, uh, something to serve some sort of, of overlord kind of uh, interest. And you do that by keeping them down, yeah. keeping them dense, limited in consciousness, yeah. and with more and more stuff implanted in them that can be monitored and manipulated. Yeah, well, that's, that's fascinating because if this breaks, it, and it's what makes this period of time so fascinating and interesting because what you're essentially, what we're talking about is a breakout from that, an emergent kind of component out of this large scale, broad based attempt to kind of suppress and keep people, you know, drink beer and watch television and buy stuff and, and be afraid, you know, uh, because of the terrorists and so on. And, and those things in this kind of context are all trying to sustain and maintain the status quo where the powers that be can, can maintain the control. And so what's happening here is this extraordinary kind of fundamental breaking out that has the basis, I would argue, for the seed for the new world that's emerging. Uh, and as a byproduct of that, or as a, as, as a product of it, uh, is this new human that is going to see the world in a different way and have different kind of values. I call it trans-reality Earth. That's where we're headed. And uh, as I mentioned a few minutes ago, all the mystics throughout the ages have foreseen this. They've forecast it. Uh, but thanks to technology, uh, we're so speeded up now in, in how this is progressing. 
uh, once that critical mass factor of consciousness changes, that can't be controlled by any outside force. And so the, the liberated human being um, is going to transcend uh, efforts to, to be manipulated. So it's very critical now for the manipulative forces to keep a lid on everything. And uh, I think it's getting harder and harder to do. And I think things are going to get worse before they get better, and many people uh, feel that way. Yeah. More of these terrorist attacks and Bad, other such uh, things. And manipulated weather disasters. Weather, weather things. I mean, there's really serious indications for a long time that says governments are playing with the weather and driving the hurricanes that we're experiencing, perhaps that we're experiencing now around and so on. Uh, generating earthquakes different places and so on I mean this is there's a lot going on uh, kind of under the table between uh, countries uh, the major countries in the world that uh, most people don't understand or certainly are not aware of and uh, or and, and think that they're just kind of natural natural events that's going on uh, it's it's a fascinating fascinating time so where do you think this is all going well, I'm very optimistic. Uh, I think in the, in the long run, um, the elevation of human consciousness will prevail, um, and uh, that this may be one of the, um, the reasons behind these contact experiences, that if, if people are not going to take the initiative of their own, uh, because they are mired in the material world, then this injection, uh, kind of a, um, you know, a kick in the rear, uh, so to speak, yeah. from uh, some sort of otherworldly contact um, seems to be the key to do it uh, because um, people who, um, in, in uh, talking to experiencers, um, there are people who never thought about these things, yeah. didn't even believe in them, and uh, suddenly they have some experiences that cause them to re-examine, re-evaluate, and uh, shift their worldview. Now, one significant thing, too, that uh, is, is uh, revealed in, in our uh, survey is how people have shifted in their spiritual beliefs after contact. And the big loser is organized religion. Mm. Uh, and that has profound implications for uh, the organization of society. I mean, religion is a political force. And uh, it's an organizing force. And if you lose major religion, um, that, that is a catastrophic thing right there. But people say that from their experiences, uh, they, um, they shift their views on the afterlife, on reincarnation, on spirituality. And uh, an astounding number of them said they no longer feel a need to go to church because church doesn't have any answers for them. They have a, but they feel intensely spiritual, but they have to get it themselves. So when is religion going to wake up and smell the coffee? Well, I think that that model, as you've described it, or the, the um, uh, erosion of that structural element in the environment that we live in, i.e. religion, uh, you can walk yourself around in terms of science and in terms of geopolitics and any number of other places and see the same kind of implosion and the threat, the threats to uh, to them and you know from a number of perspectives you can look at kind of them from a structural point of, say, point of view and say that they're absolutely unsustainable and that it's only an, it's inevitable and only a matter of time before they all kind of collapse and become increasingly ineffective and so the question becomes how does this new world emerge and uh, who are the folks to help to kind of seed it and how it becomes, and, and then that's the essence, I think, of the kind of things that we're talking about here, is that what you're starting to see is these anomalous kinds of, of uh, inputs and reactions and things that if you can cluster them and you can see them in some kind of patterns, they're really quite encouraging. Uh, well, it's definitely exciting, that's for sure. And uh, when you consider that human beings have organized themselves around religion uh, from, from our earliest days of, of civilization, um, what would we do 
if we had no religion, uh, are, yeah, are, are we going to have a new religion? Science is a religion. All of them are these kind of structured kind of perspectives that were the model, the best model at the time, perhaps, the, to explain the inexplicable, perhaps. And, and as you get smarter and more open and exposed, then you, you, they, they don't work as well. Well, they don't. And, you know, I do a, a lot of work in afterlife studies, afterlife communication. And um, I found it very interesting that what the dead have to say about the afterlife through direct experience, direct experience through uh, communication, uh, dream visits, uh, channelers and mediums, does not support religion. Uh, but that we can talk about the next time because we're out of, town or, uh, out of time right now. And it's been delightful to have you with us. Here, thank you, John. Uh, thanks, Rosemary Ellen Guiley. has been with us here on Postscript, coming to you from Berkeley Springs, West Virginia, in our wonderful little town, and we hope you'll come out. She's going to be speaking with us this afternoon uh, as we do these things on Saturday afternoons at Berkeley Springs Transition Talks, and we'd invite you to come. You can find more information about that at transitiontalks.org. And I'm John Peterson from the Arlington Institute, and thanks for being with us.